This is God's Quality Control 14.2.1. Here, I continue my analysis of movies about Jesus, exploring the enormous disconnect between what people tend to believe about him with what is actually written in the Gospels. In this video and the next three, I will cover the 1977 British miniseries Jesus of Nazareth, directed by Franco Zeffirelli. Unlike Mel Gibson's gore-fest Passion of the Christ, which laser focuses on the brutal torments of Jesus' final hours, Zeffirelli's movie slogs through the full gospel story, from the betrothal of Jesus' parents through his birth, ministry, death, and resurrection. And it is indeed a slog. Six and a half hours of glacially paced establishing shots and long, pointless silences, punctuated by some of the most cringe-inducing acting I've ever seen which is exacerbated by the expectations one might have of the star-studded cast, including some of the biggest names of the day, among them Laurence Olivier and Anne Bancroft. The movie starts off introducing us to young Joseph, Jesus' human stepfather, and Joseph's intended wife, the ridiculously young girl, Mary. In line with the Gospel account, God very rudely waits until after the betrothal to violate the poor girl, and it is indeed a violation. Even if she were a grown woman, who can say no to the supreme being of all things? Worse, what kind of credentials did God provide to her to prove his identity? I mean, back then it was pretty common for gods to go around violating and impregnating human women. Mary had no way of knowing which god she was talking to, if it were in fact a god at all, and not just some extraterrestrial prankster pervert manipulating her mind with advanced technology. Unsurprisingly, neither the Bible nor the movie mentions any of this. The poor girl, and poor Joseph, who must have felt humiliated when his betrothed announced after returning from a three-month visit to her relative Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, that she was pregnant with someone else's child. In one of the rare moments of good acting, Joseph clearly demonstrates his conviction that it wasn't God she had sex with, but a man. The marriage ceremony is embarrassingly serious. Mary looks guilty and Joseph looks jealous and suspicious. The movie is faithful to the almost certainly fictitious account in the Gospel of Luke wherein a nationwide census requires the entire population of Judea to uproot themselves and travel to each man's ancestral hometown. While Joseph and the heavily pregnant Mary trudge off to Bethlehem, Three oriental kings follow a UFO that appears to hover over a random cave near that village. The Gospel of Luke refers to this unidentified aerial phenomenon as a star, which is obviously impossible. Speculation throughout the centuries has it that the object was actually a Chinese spy balloon. But this movie hints at the truth by casting James Earl Jones, the voice of Darth Vader. It was actually the Death Star. So in a sense, it really was a star after all. Camping out with the other Oriental kings, Darth Vader opines that the Messiah will bring peace to the world, which is in direct contradiction to the words of Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 10, I did not come to bring peace but a sword, after which Jesus grotesquely fantasizes about families tearing themselves apart and killing each other because of him. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That all comes later. After the child is born, shepherds come from the fields to worship him, saying that they've been told by angels that Jesus has come for the poor. This is bullshit, as even a casual reading of the Gospels makes it painfully clear that Jesus was supremely pro-rich and only dimly aware of the actual suffering of actual poor people. For him, the poor were an abstract concept, a token of rich people's relationship with God. But I'm getting ahead of myself again. When King Herod hears about this new king of the Jews being born, he orders his soldiers to go out and kill all the newborn males in the area. What's left out by both the movie and the Bible is any explicit mention of God's hideous failure of compassion. In the Bible, he appears to Joseph in a dream, telling him to flee with the child to Egypt. Unfortunately for everyone else in the area, God doesn't sound a general alarm or intervene in any way. As he so often does, he allows or commands the slaughter of babies to advance his questionable purposes. After Herod dies, Joseph returns to his home in Nazareth with his young wife and his blonde-haired, blue-eyed son. As the boy grows, a second child actor, also blonde-haired and blue-eyed, is brought in. 
I'm not sure whether it actually needs to be said that the Bible never describes Jesus as having a Northern European look about him. One can only imagine Joseph's ongoing humiliation and fury every time he looked at this child who doesn't even look Jewish. Maybe the God who violated Mary wasn't the Jewish God Yahweh after all. Maybe it was Thor. As an aside, the Quran talks about Jesus occasionally, and depending on how you take it, it's either comical or creepy. Muhammad has Jesus speaking like an adult at birth, schooling his fellow Jews, basically talking about how he came to earth to be a good Muslim. Like most religious concepts, it's weird only if you didn't grow up with it. The Gospel of Luke describes Jesus being an absolute shit as a 12-year-old child. At the annual Passover festival that year, he chooses to stay behind while his family heads back home. Rather than taking steps to be reunited with them, he spends his time in the temple, supposedly showing off his wisdom to the elders there. When his distraught mother finally finds him after three days of frantic searching, he gets mouthy. So much for compassion, he clearly has no clue or concern for the anguish she experienced over her missing child. Never mind that she supposedly should have known where to find him. She didn't know, she didn't understand, and she was in agony. If there's any should have going on here, it's on God. He's the omniscient one after all. Despite near universal belief to the contrary, Jesus did not grow up poor, and the incident at the Passover festival is a perfect indication among many such indications. Jesus' family, which included quite a few siblings, made the multi-day trek from Nazareth to Jerusalem every single year. They could afford taking time off of whatever livelihood they had, as well as provisions that they would either have bought along the way or taken with them from an ample household surplus. And although Mary probably didn't eat much during those three days she was searching for her son, there's no reason to think that she slept on a bare rock. These were people of means. Jesus didn't grow up poor. His behavior throughout the Gospels is clearly not that of someone who grew up poor, or has even a faint idea of what it's like to be poor. The story skips forward 15 years or so, and we find John the Baptist standing on a rock by the Jordan River, shouting banalities about righteousness and scolding the new king, whose name also happens to be Herod, for breaking the stupid Jewish laws about marriage and divorce. Despite the appalling acting, the movie does a good job of making Herod out to be weak, henpecked by his wife, and lustful for her young daughter. The Bible doesn't go into so much detail, but it does plausibly hint at these points, explaining that Herod promises the girl anything she wants in exchange for a dance she performs for him, which results in Herod being bullied into having John the Baptist beheaded. The movie also introduces us to the Zealots. Although the term zealot is typically used in modern English as a pejorative, more or less synonymous with the word fanatic, the word was originally just the name of a Jewish sect in Jesus' day. They, like many Jews at the time, objected to Roman rule and longed for the Messiah to come overthrow the Romans and set up an independent Jewish nation. The Bible hardly mentions the zealots at all, while the movie makes them integral to the story. They see John the Baptist as potentially useful to their cause because he stirs the people's hearts. But they never get to make use of him, as we find out in the next episode. That's 14.2.1. Thanks for watching.